Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome to Shelf Stories, the channel that tells tales from games, books, and life. And welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop podcast. I'm your host, Jason Nick. So it's perfect for stopping by for this very special episode. I have not done an episode like this before with guests like this before. I'm so excited. Uh, so I have been talking about board game media uh, over the last couple episodes. We had a chat with Jamie Stegmaier from Stonemaier Games, as well as a number of publishers. Uh, I've done a number of monologues on the, on the subject and had many enthusiast reviewers on the show talking about it. I have yet to consult the area of journalism, like the capital J journalism, people who have degrees in this stuff and who are paid professionals who work for or are used to work for are attached to uh, large journalistic outfits. Yes, there are that there are some that cover our hobby, board gaming. Uh, and so I wanted to have a different kind of conversation from a different perspective. And it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce the two people who said yes. <laughs> we'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, but I, it really is. Uh, and especially um, the man uh, to, as I, I'm on the Zoom uh, to my right, who wrote an article uh, for Kotaku Magazine, which kind of got me thinking uh, in terms of, okay, we need a, a better conversation about this, a bigger one. Uh, so he is late of Kotaku, uh, wrote for them for a number of years, over 10, uh, but is now uh, on freelancing and consulting and looking forward to the next steps in his career, but will be a board game journalist and video game journalist for as long as this man is on earth he's born to do it he is luke plunkett welcome to the show thanks for having me it's nice to be here and also we have a man who is literally the most famous person who has ever appeared on the show i am so starstruck about it he he actually introduced himself to me he's like jason i enjoy your work i'm like what is Perfect. happening here uh this person i've been listening to uh for uh, over no decades at this point, uh, uh, in his capacity as a baseball writer and a member of the Baseball Writers of America, so coming at it from that own journalistic background, but has a very huge uh, board game imprint. If you go to his blog, The Dish, there are over 300 board game reviews and a uh, frequenter of a lot of cons. He is Keith Law of The Athletic and other places. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right. So we are going to get into it. And Luke and I were joking at the beginning of the thing. It's like, we're just going to pop on the conversation for Monday evening, talking about born game media and <laughs> potential conflicts of interest and paid sponsor content. It's just a light breezy chat. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so um, let's set the scene. So over the course of the last couple of months, we have had a number of brouhaha's. Uh, in board game media, and this is not new. I mean, this is this kind of thing happens frequently. Uh, you know, months and months and months will pass by, and then there'll be a conversation on a a forum or a Facebook post or something like that. Uh, the precipitating event I'm thinking of happened a couple of months ago. Uh, the board game YouTube channel Quackalope uh, got into a little bit of hot water when a series of emails were released on the behalf uh, by the publisher, uh, seeming to indicate that uh, this channel would provide positive content. Uh, in exchange for some monetary uh, exchange. And then uh, if the monetary exchange wasn't going to happen, then they're going to release more difficult content. Uh, so like just whatever you think about that, it just seemed a little bit dodgy. So it kind of raised some alarm bells. That happened a couple of months ago. We're not going to delve into that specifically. Just a little while ago, about a week ago, an article came out in Board Game Wire that talked about uh, the FTC uh, taking a little bit more notice about how influencers show and dis and disclose and it was uh specific to board games about how we were had to review copies and paid sponsor content all that kind of thing these conversations are live so i'm gonna go to luke first because you had written an article about the quackalope thing but that second half of the article keyed around a word coziness please tell us what you understand by the word coziness in reference to board game media Wow, how long have we got? Um, I guess I should. I guess I should. I should preface everything I'm about to say for the rest of this podcast with the fact that I, I was and am a primarily a video game journalist, and mm -hmm. so my experience with board games, while I'm an incredibly avid board gamer, like personally, my experience with it professionally, is sort of on the periphery of my day job. So I'm not as involved in the sort of day to day. Um, details of these things as as some other people might be so i'm sort of just coming at this from the side but but the you're the journalist the, i and that's yeah, very the, the coziness the coziness that i have a problem with in a lot of board game content creation I'm, i struggle to call it media sometimes 
is mm. just this inherent almost desire for people to be to have very close relationships with games publishers um their their whole sort of reason for being almost to run a youtube channel or, or some other form of media is to develop these relationships so that they get sent games to play and then develop and maintain those relationships by constantly being in communication with the people who have sent them the product that they're covering and in like as somebody who has spent a career in journalism like that's just red flag after red flag after red flag like it's <laughs> you shouldn't be pursuing any kind of relationship with a publisher beyond like maybe getting a game for coverage. You know, the idea that you're working with and developing positive, constant positive working relationships with publishers is like, just, it's wild to me. <laughs> and so coziness <laughs> is probably underselling it. Coziness is something we would use in video games for like, I'm not saying video games is perfect at all. Like video games has its own set of problems that you could probably have your own 10 hour series on <laughs> delving into but there is at least a recognition that there must be some distance kept with a lot of traditional video games media that you just simply don't see in nearly all board game coverage and so yeah coziness is putting it lightly i think okay <laughs> we'll start light and we'll, we'll see where the conversation goes yeah we'll see where the, we go <laughs> uh, as it goes on uh so uh you're a, in a little bit of a different position geek because you're not working for like that's not what you do with the athletic right you, you don't uh right. write for the board game industry you just see it and so i wanted you to have you on here because you have that again journalistic perspective uh and so what do you think in terms of that a particular question of coziness or whatever word you want to use well, there is a bit of a parallel to what I do for the athletic and previous to that, what I was doing at ESPN, where I, uh, you know, for folks who don't follow my my baseball content, um, I particularly cover prospects, players who not are not yet at the uh, the top level, Major League Baseball in uh, here in the United States, who uh, might be in the minor leagues or even college or high school players still. And as part of the job, I have to have some kind of relationship with people uh, with all 30 major league organizations, because I talk to them about the players in their system. And often I need information from them and often solicit their opinions. Also, who do you think is the best prospect in your system? Or, oh, I noticed so-and-so hasn't pitched recently. Is he hurt? Um, there's no other way to get that information. Mm -hmm. And so I have to develop a relationship without compromising my integrity too, because I have to be able and willing to say, hey, I don't think this guy's very good or, oh, that trade you just made. I think that was really unfavorable to your team and better for the other team. I have to be as I have, I have to be completely objective and the readers have to believe that I'm completely objective. Although there will always be fans who think I hate their team specifically <laughs> because especially right. because they're not used to maybe to getting negative co uh, commentary, to hearing both sides, essentially that sometimes I'll like your team's moves and sometimes I won't like your team's moves. And so I've always been a freelancer writing about board game stuff. I've been doing stuff for Paste for nine years now, and I've written for five or six sites in total, uh, always as a freelancer. But as part of that, I do have exactly the kind of relationship Luke just described, where I know people at publishers and uh, ask for review copies as appropriate. And there are certain publishers that just send send me review copies without me having to prompt them. And that's fine, although I do often tell publishers Feel free to check first because I might say, I'm not going to review that, give that review copy to someone else. But to me, the relationship can't be any more than that. Mm -hmm. I it, There can't be any sort of, it's payola to me to say, well, we're going to pay you X amount of money. And I have seen publishers do this. And once or twice, someone has approached me and say, you know, if you'll do this kind of content, we'll pay you $300 or something. So, no, I can't, I can't do that because my primary type of writing around board games, I've done a few features, but... Uh, it's mostly reviews. And at that point, if I do that even one time, take money from a publisher uh, to do some kind of promotional content, I think I am permanently compromised. At that point, mm. I don't know if people would, whether people know it or not, I wouldn't take myself seriously as a reviewer. It also means I have to feel free to give a negative review. And I did have an issue with a specific publisher that is still active, where for about a year or so, that not only would they not send me games, they wouldn't talk to me at all because I gave one negative review of a mm. particular game. And uh, the person who was sort of responsible for that is not in the position anymore. I don't want to name the publisher. I'm certainly not looking to make any of that public. But yeah. it was a little jarring to me because it's, hey, I just didn't like one game. 
right? It's not the end of the world, but they were pretty, it was, the silence was immediate. I got the silent treatment from a publisher because mm-hmm. of one bad review. And it was a reminder, this industry and the media coverage of it is still pretty immature that we it's, it, it's not as professionalized as what I'm used to seeing, certainly in the sports industry. The sports industry has, media industry has its own issues, but there is a level of professionalism, especially of those of us who do this full time that I don't see as much in board game journalism. And that's exactly why I wanted, like, I, I know both of you have said, okay, we're kind of glancing at, you know, there's not like hardcore board game journalists, but guess what? There are no hardcore board games. They, they don't exist. So it's like, not like right. I, I, can, I can ask them, right? Um, so so many different directions and I'm going to try to remember each one. Uh, let me pick up on Luke's thing. Uh, the, uh, the idea of media, right? And you had said, okay, I struggle to call this media. And in some ways, and I'm, I'm speaking from an enthusiast perspective. Like I am board game media, right? That you could see it, and I have like you know hundreds and hundreds of videos mm-hmm. and reviews and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm in the middle of it, and I've gotten invited to you know, packs and wherever else uh, on media badges, media badges, right? Mm-hmm. So like you go to the media page and you get a media badge, and I've had the experience, and this was at Packs Unplugged, and this actually actually every year, but it's funny to see it. So like they won't just give a standard media badge; they will give out like some badge will say media. And some badges will say content creator. And mm-hmm. everyone wants the media badge. <laughs> if you get the content creator badge, we're all like kind of trading, looking to trade. It's like, okay, I don't want to be a content creator. I want to be media. So I think instinctually, we understand the difference between media and content creator. But let's tease it out. Because I think that mm-hmm. really gets to the heart of, you know, journalism and, you know, what is expected of people who call themselves journalists and reviewers, et cetera. So help us understand, look, what you where your struggle is in calling what board game content creation is doing media currently. Yeah, well, media is a is a word that implies a certain degree of distance and professionalism and criticism um, of of a medium or a field that we associate with, you know, the New York Times, you know, newspapers and and journalistic endeavors. Um a couple of friends filming themselves playing board games and then posting it on YouTube um, is not media yet because that's very quickly became the predominant form of board game coverage on the internet, given how late it's developed versus a lot of other comparable mediums that just seems to have settled into being the default um, setting for it. And so because the first thing most people did to cover board games was film themselves playing board games, that's become board mm-hmm. game media. Um, and I think it sucks because it, it, <laughs> it, that, that word means something, you know, words, words do have to mean something at the end of the day. And most board game media does not come close to being like it's media in, in, in a different sense of the word in that it is video content, you know, it, it but it's not media the way that it's being phrased in that it implies some kind of, endeavor and and uh, not objective but critical look at what they're covering and that sort of stuff so it's Mm -hmm. definitely i find it very strange that like you described i like i'm not going to be spoiling anything here but there is a major facebook group called board game media and reviewers or something board game reviewers and media yes that's the one that's the one one. and it this video will be posted on that channel so okay uh, well there you go say hi to everybody yeah okay hi everybody you're not going to like what i'm about to say but (laughs) (laughs) i feel i maybe the algorithm is feeding me the wrong posts i don't know but i feel like 90 to 95 percent of the posts i see there are just people with a small youtube channel like talking about getting paid by a publisher to do a preview of a game and i'm like that's not media that's that's advertising that's that's content creation you know and so using the word media for that to me just seems a bit off Mm -hmm. uh keith you had just to kind of contextualize this a little bit uh use the word immature and i've heard that a number of times from different people who have uh you know i've spoken with and to be to be clear full disclosure uh, that's what media uh, things, the full disclosure. Uh, I put this invite to a number of different outlets. So Wirecutter and Polygon and uh, Dicebreaker. And it, there's a number of folks out there who are covering this stuff for different reasons. Uh, there was a struggle with getting everybody together. So I'm glad we were able to have this conversation. Um, so in those conversations that I've had, um, that word does come up of immature. Uh, and mm-hmm. so if you can say a little bit more about what you meant by that relative to some of the other um, things you're experiencing. 
Yeah, well, I think back to, um, you know, Gen Con is upon us, right? I've already sort of sketched out. I have my little spreadsheet of which publishers I want to see and which games they might have. Oh, my my cat is joining us as well. Um, what listeners of my regular, <laughs> yes, the listeners of my regular podcast will recognize his voice. He's a jerk. Um, he knows when I'm recording something and then he has to chime in. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to pet him with one hand and continue talking. So I even remember going back to Tony Gen Con for the first time and um, got a media badge. They were wonderful. And um, and I was hooked, obviously. I can't not go to Gen Con. That's unthinkable at this point. But I also remember thinking, oh, there's this media stuff. There's not that many people here who look like me. I mean, I don't mean like demographically. I mean, in terms plenty of- plenty of guys look like you demographically. Oh, <laughs> uh, they all look like me, right? The whole world. Like, nobody's asking for more people who look like me, me included. <laughs> um, that's a topic for another podcast. Sure. But um, it, just thinking as uh, th- thinking about this immaturity question, a level of professionalism, right? People who, who act a bit like journalists. And trust me, there are plenty of times I'm, mouthing off on social media where people say that's not really very professional that's not even what i'm talking about just luke you mentioned you know talking about p- people write for the new york times for example right and the, the athletic being part of the new york times we have standards we have pretty high standards for a lot of our journalism for example for sourcing when a player gets called up to the major leagues um if we are going to write something about it there's an expectation that we will you know, even if it's already been reported elsewhere, someone might come to me and say, can you confirm this? And then they will ask who I confirmed it with. We may not even publish who that person is, but to make sure that it's right. And there are quite a few standards that I have to abide by in all of my writing, whether I'm breaking news or whether this is opinion. And you know, obviously on the board game side, what I do at least is entirely opinion, but I just carry those standards over because mm-hmm. that's how I work. I think my observation of a lot of board game media or maybe content creators would be the better way to describe them is that they don't, they don't have those standards. If you don't have experience working as a full-time journalist, you may not have learned those standards. So I'm not even necessarily blaming these people. I don't mean to be looking down on these people, but they didn't learn them. If you didn't come up in that environment, then you don't have that kind of journalistic standards. I worked with somebody, David Kraft was his name at ESPN for a long time, who um, was wonderful to work with and was he was my guy on if I had an an ethical or other similar question about journalistic standards, he was the one I would talk to. Is this right? What would I need to, here's something I heard, what things would I need to do to make this a reportable story for us, given our editorial standards? That doesn't really exist in the board game world. And even people who are pretty, I think, well-known content creators, I I often notice, I I watch their videos or or otherwise listen, consume their content and have that question, right? Hmm. Did someone else look at this? Did an editor with 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 written standards go through this and say and maybe ask questions what about this did you consider that it doesn't seem like it's gone through that kind of rigor and i use the word immature because despite the fact board gaming having existed for you know obviously decades it's grown so much in the you know 10ish years since i've been involved in it and I feel like the media side has not caught up yet. I mean, this is a business mm. of considering the annual revenues globally of board gaming. It is almost shocking to me the lack of really professional media coverage that there is in this space. Okay. I'm so glad we walked into that. So uh, just to frame the conversation for people, especially in the board game media reviewers and media group, because some people are going to watch it. Um, I will speak for that enthusiast side and, you know, but I want the, the journalists to have their voice first so that we can speak clearly about it. So, okay. Um, that's a big question. The sixty-four thousand dollars question for me is why has board gaming not developed? I mean, it seems like with the you know um, Gloomhaven just finished their four million dollar uh, you know uh, Kickstarter, and that's four million dollars on like a beta site. That wasn't like you know if that was on Kickstarter, that probably would have gone double or whatever it is. Uh, so they were just trying something, and so the money and not every product is like that, but like the money is seems to be there, seems to be there. We have hedge funds <laughs> that own some of our companies. It's not like it's uh you know the, there's a whole bunch of reasons to me why it seemed like board gaming will get the attention of outfits like you know and and to put real resources into journalism, but the journalism isn't happening. It, it's it really is too the creators, the, the content creators to provide the coverage for that, you know, informs the people. So why? 
<laughs> do you have any mm -hmm. insight as to, uh, I, I guess like, you know, that's why is it a bad open ended question, but like, are there, are there mitigating barriers? Are there specific mitigating factors that might be stunting the development of board game journalism? Or do you think it's more of a natural, it'll get there just like video games and other things get there? Go ahead, Luke. I think there's two competing problems here. I think the first is that a lot of the other journalism fields that it's going to be compared to in the enthusiast press, and that's video games, tech, cars, a lot of that sort of stuff, are decades old. And so these have evolved back in the newspaper days, in the magazine days, in the early internet days where the only things on the internet was the written word. And so they evolved sort of in the shadow of more established forms of cultural media, like film reviewing, like just general journalistic standards. And so like when I first started at Kotaku, there was a real, I'm not going to say we were great at it, but there was a real urge to try and improve the journalistic standards in video games by reporting hard news, by holding people accountable, by making sure we actually source things. Um, I feel like the explosion in board games popularity, even though they've, even though, like he said, they've been around for decades, it's really only the last 10 or so years that they've seemed to have exploded into a something approaching mainstream sort of entertainment medium beyond like I, everyone's always played Monopoly, but you know what I mean? Like these more, yeah, a more evolved games. Board, board game scene. Yeah. Um, and it's evolved in a completely different space. It's evolved in a world that now has YouTube and TikTok and influencers and content creation. And that stuff's got a much lower barrier to entry than journalism does, which most people working in journalism have some kind of degree, whether it's in journalism or something related. Anyone can prop a camera up on a table and film themselves playing a board game. And so that coupled with, you know, how fun it is to just play a board game and film it and talk about it instead of doing stories and and reporting and writing about things in a traditional journalistic sense I mean I think that's just how it evolved like how it's evolved is a reflection of the time it's evolved in um and the other factor that's sort of joining in on that is that journalism itself is is in serious trouble yeah. at the moment right. like the reason there are very few dedicated board game sites is that there's just no there's no means to financially support them. Um, like you, you look at, I, I know from, from personal experience, video game journalism as it exists is shrinking and shrinking because those markets that we used to rely upon that were advertising driven are collapsing in the face of, you know, various factors that we don't have time to get into here today, but mm -hmm. it's harder than ever today to just start a website and say, Hey, here's a board game website. Cause who's going to pay you, you know? Um, board game publishers? Well, no, if you want to set up a proper board game website, you probably can't have board game publishers running the advertising. And so mm -hmm. you run into that problem as well. And so it's this perfect storm of it's evolved in a time that is also the worst possible time to start a new journalistic endeavor, mm -hmm. um, which is probably also why a lot of the, the more serious coverage comes from, and I'm not I'm not tooting my own horn here, but it, it's come from video game websites because we have at least had established staff with some kind of journalistic experience who because board games and video games share so many spaces we've been able to just dip into that and be able to cover it so whether it's Kotaku whether it's Polygon PC Gamer IGN Eurogamer mm -hmm. uh, you know lots of sites where people can at least cover board games from the periphery but yeah it doesn't surprise me one bit that there isn't like a towering all-encompassing number one board game news website because I just don't see a way that such a thing could happen in 2023. But that is not even on the horizon. I mean, uh, you know, my man is yeah, well, like works for yeah. uh, the New York Times, who just cut thousands of staff. ESPN just cut thousands of. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the New York Times famously has never had a video game vertical or subsite. Yeah. You know, it's 2023. The, the number <laughs> one t the number one TV show last year was a video game. Video games uh, make more money than you know. It's a tired old stat, but they make more money than Hollywood, right. and and you know. The New York Times has never had a video game subsite and the Washington Post just opened and closed their video game vertical recently. Um, mm. And that's video games, which is like makes way more money and has a much larger yep. cultural footprint than board games. So board games really have no chance.
uh, the uh, way I, things stand at the moment. I'm going to bounce a theory off of Keith and let me know what you think. Yeah, sure. um, there's a couple of, okay, so to articulating like barriers, right? So one is the technological age that we're in, journalism and media, capital J, capital M, are struggling right now. Um, yep. In your experience, because you know, you've had a readership and cultivated it, um, is the audience, is there an audience thirst for this stuff? Because I think there is a consumer thirst for journalism because of the wall of positive coverage and whatever it is. But is that's not the same thing as saying like there's a groundswell of like normies who would uh, you right. know you know thumb through and actually enjoy board game media, whether it's critical takes of games or critical takes of publishers or whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, so does that have a role, or or, or are there any other barriers that you would detect? Yeah, that's uh, it's a great question. Um, yes, there there are I mean there are substantial barriers. I thought Luke's answer was was really excellent in um, detailing a lot of those, um, a lot of those uh, really more structural barriers that exist here. I think also, you, Jason, as you just alluded to, there are some technological barriers also obstructing um, the possibility of, of this becoming a larger, um, a larger space for writers, for whether it's you know, whether it is reviews, whether it is commentary, whether it is features, um, you know, I think your question started with, is there a thirst for this kind of content? My general answer to that is yes, because I exist, right? <laughs> because, because I write these pieces, I have some idea of how well they do. And because publishers, um, not game publishers, but, but online outlets approach me to write for them, there's some audience, mm. It's still pretty niche, which I find so hard to believe given the size of the industry. When I speak to friends outside of the board gaming world and they sometimes ask about, you know, I think most people who know my writing know on some level that I also write about board games and they'll, you know, sort of, do people play those? Is that still a thing? And then <laughs> yep, I'll the drop some real. Dumb, right? which I don't care if you don't like my hobby. Like I am not that, you know, there's a long old online joke, please like my sport where people try to, you know, claim the sport they like or the sport they cover is better than other sports. It's like, I don't care if you don't like the board games I play. Like that doesn't matter. You don't get to come to my house and play the board games, right? That's your loss, not my loss. So it's not even about that necessarily, but it is, it is, there is plenty of interest and plenty of spillover from people who you call them normies. You know, I think of them as casuals, right? They're, mm -hmm. Or they're future board gamers, right? We can pull those people in. And if I'm an evangelist at all, I'm not an evangelist for any individual games or any individual publishers. I'm an evangelist for the for the, the hot in general. I want to bring people in say, this is a fun thing. This is a thing I really enjoy with friends, with family. My wife was not into board games at all. She liked games in general. She's a big poker player, wasn't into board games. Now she kind of is. She'll never admit it, but she'll listen to this and then she'll be like, okay, fine. I like some board games. <laughs> um, but the, uh, it, 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 which is a long way of saying, does the thirst exist? Does the audience exist? The media can't exist if the audience doesn't exist. That is ultimately the question. Right. Then there's this, the second question that comes after that is, is there a workable revenue model? That That's where I think we run into trouble, right? The audience, okay. there's enough audience there. To piggyback on what Luke said as well, this is a this is not a great time for starting a new vertical or a new site. Um, the, what is a vertical? Model, Just to, I'm, I'm very curious. So thinking about... Um, you know, at the athletic, we would probably define our verticals largely as individual sports. That I'm in the baseball vertical. We have football. We have soccer, and then we have some that go, that are cross sports. But it is essentially it's like departments, essentially. Mm -hmm. okay. At the New York Times, you know, I don't know how the New York Times specifically would describe these things, but that they have obviously have different sections. They have news. They have a sports desk. We won't touch that particular topic right now. But they have business. They don't business. have a sports desk. Is what they, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> Okay, as, as there's far a grievance, as what we know. there's a grievance coming, right? The Got union, it. Is, union is fighting. I'm just watching from over here. I'm yeah, I have sure. nothing to do with it. So, but also they have, you know, wire cutter, for example. And then within wire cutter, Luke, you refer to sub verticals, for example, that the New York Times doesn't have a video game sub vertical. They don't have a video game writer at all. If wire cutter, they may wire cutter may have some of that content, but that's a niche within a sub site, right? That is that you're two levels down in the hierarchy at this point, and so. You know, I think what you might see more of 
I don't know if there are likely to be many more of me who are just, yeah, I show up on a site and I am the board game person. Mm -hmm. that, that's okay. You know, I think if there were five or 10 of me kicking around doing this kind of content professionally, like trying to bring journalistic standards that we know from, from other work into this space, that would be a huge net benefit. I would absolutely welcome that. But there's not a lot of us. And again, I'm not you know, I hope nobody takes this as a criticism of content creators. I'm just saying there, there are very different backgrounds and different perspectives that you have from doing this as a full-time job, even if it's not about gaming, that you bring to this versus folks who are maybe creating great content, but not adhering to those kinds of standards that really define something as journalism. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to uh, raise the waters a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of our, uh, in terms of our uh, the discussion. So, uh, speaking of barriers, right? And I got this from a little mm -hmm. birdie. Not going to say who, um, but I was talking back and forth about you know journalism and why doesn't it occur? And they they wanted to specify that a barrier is some publishers that there is because there's such a I don't know why because but maybe it's a uh, part of it. Um, publisher can access a lot of enthusiast coverage, right? Or content creators. Mm -hmm. And so there is far less of a willingness, maybe, uh, to give review copies or form those relationships that you described, Keith. You know, you kind of need some of these relationships to get information. Mm -hmm. um, that that is much harder uh, when it comes to publishers uh, and journalists. Uh, that interaction that that can be difficult sometimes. And I remember this was a while ago, Keith. You, I, I'm Luke. You had, you put this in a a, a a Twitter thread about how you had written something and the way that a publisher kind of like contacted you, no names, uh, but there was like it, it, the expectation that like you would either change something or, or you know, why did you write this bad thing <laughs> kind of thing or uh, that, that, that whole thing. And that that in itself, the publisher resistance to um, board game journalism, media with capital M as we're talking, uh, could be a barrier as well. Uh, what do you think about that? Um. It's it's difficult. It's difficult to speak for everybody because board game publishing is incredibly it's diverse. It's, in terms this is of not its every publisher. No way. No cultural, way. geographical location plus the scale of the company. Um, you get some companies. I will name the the nice ones. Some companies like Stonemaier are a pleasure to work with. Mm. Um, some companies like the one you mentioned from that Twitter thread are the opposite of a pleasure to work with. <laughs> um, I think it ties back to the same stuff we were talking about about immaturity, though. Is is the medium the way people cover board games is very new um and so hand in hand with that is the fact that the way publishers deal with the people covering their games is new as well and so just like the people writing about or filming themselves or recording themselves talking about board games is a very immature and evolving medium i feel like a lot of board game publishers don't have the tools or experience to deal with those people as well um, mm -hmm. especially, and I, I used to, my real rubber meets the road moment was that, that to, to recap for people who haven't, who weren't, you know, aware of what we're talking about here, I reviewed a game on Kotaku and I won't say what it was, but this was probably five or six years ago, I think. And I gave it a, like a middling review. Mm -hmm. Was he like I said it, right. Yeah. Well, I didn't trash the game at all. I was like, you know, there's some, there's some cool stuff here, but you know, the rule, you know, the rule book might not be great, or I can't even remember the criticism or something else wasn't great. It, you know, it didn't tie together. It was a very, like in terms of the tone of our coverage at Kotaku, it was a very standard review. Um, I got abusive emails from the publisher of this game, like, like out of, like, like I've never received in video games in 17 years. And wow. I kind of laughed it off because I'm like, whatever, I'm not going to get games from these guys were anymore like mm -hmm. great well it wasn't sorry <laughs> to clarify it wasn't just that they weren't going to work with me they were like personally abusive emails they wanted um, to burn down your house uh, well pretty pretty close <laughs> Ooh, um yeah. like questioning my credentials questioning you know everything about the review and i was like man it's a review it's a subjective review i found these parts I wrote these things about these parts because that's how I, as someone who played your game, felt about them. Like, this is a pretty open and shut case in most forms of cultural criticism. Um, and a lot of board game publishers can't deal with that. Um, mm -hmm. they're, just as people have evolved very quickly into most board game coverage simply being group of friends plays game on film, um, a lot of board game publishers have defaulted to guys who are sucking up to us for free board games 
are only going to write positive things about us. You know, they they don't have the tools or the perspective to deal with serious criticism or coverage of their work. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, you you you're nodding. You had you shared one experience, but like, is that do you find uh, again? This is we have to be very careful. This is not all publishers or whatever it is. There's some right. There's no, some so I there. like right, right. I I covered board games for maybe ten or twelve years at Kotaku, and I must have reviewed god knows how many games i could go through and count them but it'd be a lot that was <laughs> that was the extreme that was the extreme example you know there, i there guess was, yeah there was like a few could, others yeah. maybe half a dozen where people would you know send slightly less concerned emails questioning credentials and asking questions or whatever but you know for the most part two-thirds three-quarters of the time publishers were fine and someone would even reach out even after a mixed to negative review and be like oh thanks for pointing that out you know we didn't realize that right. our our rule book sucked or you know something something else <laughs> before launch but yours had other reviews have helped us you know realize that and so yeah, that's I mean, fine too but just the idea that like again not all publishers but the idea that there could be some within the family that they don't just say okay this is fine but they question credentials you know, like that, that is not a thing or not near, proportionally. That's not going to be a thing that happens in other industries where it would be a thing that happens in board gaming, which is indicative of this I word immaturity that we're talking about. So uh, is that I mean, do you find you, you nodded, Keith? I mean, yeah. uh, have you fi- had people do things like question credentials, which I mean, that's what can constitute a barrier to amongst many barriers and a barrier to journalism really taking off. I have not, but the idea of publishers being less than pleased, shall we say, with anything less than glowing coverage is definitely familiar to me. It is not all publishers. The majority of the publishers I've talked to are great. They just appreciate the coverage. And I try to treat them with the same respect and also to say, hey, if I ask for a game, it's going to get coverage. I can't promise it'll be positive coverage. I might think a game looks amazing and then I sit down, I play it and the rule book's a mess. There's something wrong with the components or I just don't like the game. That just happens sometimes. Uh, In fact, that happens kind of frequently where I just find myself kind of out of sync with everyone loves this game. It's top 1000 on board game geek. And I was like, God, it just didn't speak to me at all. That happens. Challengers this year. I hate challengers. That didn't send me a review (laughs) copy. So I feel even more free. I think that game's terrible. What, wasn't it, um, what you would call it, a, a spirit of genre or something like that? It won. It, oh, it won, won the freaking thing. <laughs> I was like, I mean, this is like when Green Book won the Oscar. And I was like, I'm actually mad about this now. <laughs> okay, this isn't like, that was offensive on a more like, you sure. know, that's like, you know, white savior complex, whatever, whatever. But still, <laughs> like, I was actually mad when Challengers won. I'm like, there's no way. That is, what are we even looking for at this Mm. point if that's winning your game of the year award Uh, okay enough but there to the to the the broader question i there are people there are publishers out there because of the immaturity of the media space right there are publishers out there who view media strictly as promotion you're gonna we're gonna work with you and you're gonna help promote our games now i think on some level the fact that i review any game is just promotion because it makes sure people have heard of it and it's entirely possible someone will re- will read a review I wrote that is not entirely favorable and still be interested in the game. That's entirely possible. That is on me, I think, to make sure I provide a good review, a balanced review, a well-written review. Mm-hmm. Um, if I can do that of a game and, and that I didn't particularly like, but someone else might read that and say, well, at least I understand what's in the game. Maybe that game's not for Keith and it's for me. You know what? I don't really like most deck builders. But I also know that that's a really popular genre. And if I do review a deck building game, I try to do it in a way that if you like that genre, you'll at least read my review and know what what to expect in the game, for example. But I think a lot of publishers also don't really get that. And that's where you get, for example, this kind of hostility that Luke was describing where, you know, I didn't get that. I got the silent treatment, for example, or, or other company, you know, or somebody will just, you know, you'll get the sort of obnoxious comment or email at some point afterwards, or they're just less likely to work with you in the future. I've just accepted that. It's possible that some companies will, uh, some publisher will going forward say, you know what, we don't want to work with Keith anymore. They're just not going to send me review copies and I just won't review them. And, you know, that stinks, but that's the nature of the nature of the beast. And if that means my, you know, annual lists of the best games in the, you know, best board games of the year are a little bit less complete, Oh, yeah, 
It happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't love it, but I have to accept that. I'm not going to curry favor just to try to get more copies of games. And because I also limit how much I'm actually willing to spend of my own money to buy games to Mm -hmm. review, um, you know, that's, that's just a decision that I've made because it's not my full-time job. And I don't, you know, there, at some point it'd be hard to go to turn to my wife and say, yeah, I'm actually losing money doing yeah. this every year. <laughs> right? We're not going to do that. But the point, the point being, it, it is a choice that I've had to make. I accept that, but other people might say, I don't want to make that choice because I don't want to lose access. And that's, you know, I think back to the founding of Deadspin, the, the, sports site, my friend Will Leach founded where, you know, it was sports coverage without access or favor. Um, I think there was a third thing they said, but the point was you, they weren't depending on access. They weren't just trying to be beat writers who were at the stadium every night and were worried about their media badge, maybe getting pulled. So they can't, couldn't do their job anymore. The idea is we're going to write about this from the outside. And because we're on the outside and we accept that we're outsiders it means we don't have to worry about losing access and we'll just be more honest as a result. And I think that's why the site was successful. And and it's just, you know, for those of us who do board game writing, it's a choice we have to make. Are we willing to lose the access? I am. Mm. Others may not be. Mm. That's a, such a key thing. Like, are we willing to lose the access? And a, a good question to kind of like pause on and be like, okay, whoever's watching this, who's interested in media space, okay, am I willing to lose the access? This is one good question. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Um, So let's drill down. Uh, There is a, like, Basically, the big boogeyman in this conversation is like the paid review, right? And mm-hmm. that's that. Just just put those two words together in any forum. And it's like you know, BDG, Reddit, and Facebook is like paid review. Uh, and so the 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 problem is it becomes there's like a, a huge lack of clarity and there's a massive gray gray area. And now I'm going to start talking a little bit into the in, the enthusiast the way you look at it, right? So mm-hmm. there is one side which is what y'all are describing, which is the occasional review copy, right? Just because this is, you know, the the publisher, you know, they it's, it's like, you know, um, what you would call it, like A.O. Scott or what he used to anyway, you know, would get a free screener or would get, you know, people would get uh, DVD things or get a free meal if you're an art critic. So like it, within that, like the occasional review copy with distance is that's, you know, we're, we're in the realm of like, okay, ethical behavior. That's one extreme. And the other mm-hmm. extreme is the publisher says, here's my game, here's a bag of cash and go. <laughs> and that would be like the other extreme. So like when people say paid review, I think people are kind of thinking of that. And you know, okay, so I, I can honestly say I, I really do feel like that doesn't happen, despite all the the stuff with you know that other channel that I mentioned before. Um, mm-hmm. But that, that but that's like a big boogie when we talk about it. In between that is a huge gray area, right? So I think uh, I forget who it was that mentioning a term. I think it was Keith where he said, okay, if I take a single dollar for any coverage that I make, I'm compromised. So uh, <laughs> I get nods. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. So I think there is a, a a thing where it's like, okay, the same outfit will do a paid preview and it's labeled and paper motion and everything. But then elsewhere on their channel or elsewhere on like in the some video, there'll be like reviews that are unpaid and whatever it is. But it's the same mm-hmm. people doing it, right? And it's the same outfit that does it. So it's kind of like, um, you know, right. Right. And so it's like, okay, my here's my preview to my reviews. Uh, or the quote unquote review copy hustle. Right. So like, okay, what how do I know the <laughs> difference between getting the occasional review copy and being on the review copy hustle? And like, okay, so now so that feels like that second thing feels like it's in a, in that gray area. I'm not getting payment, I'm not getting cash, but there's a little bit of a something that I'm getting as well. So the the I think the enthusiast is going to want to live in that gray area and learn about kind of how to live ethically in that gray area. Is that mm-hmm. possible? Or in order to be in order to be beat media, do we truly have to be on that independent critical stage? What do you think, Luke? No, I, you can't. Like you said, if once you take one dollar, that's it. Um, I don't think there is a gray area. Like once, that's all. it. That that is your perspective. Once you take yeah. one, yeah, that's it. even if but that's I don't think, a, an independent I don't, thing, right? Nope. So, I don't I'm think just... you even need to take a dollar. I I think even a a continual cozy relationship with a publisher is more than enough to do the same thing. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter if they pay you or not. If the end result is wall to wall endless positive coverage of their of their products, which is what these are to them, um, it's the same end result. I think once you take one step off that i think you need to be very strict with how you're covering games and you need to be very clear with why you're getting into this and what kind of stuff you're producing and if you stray from that even once i think 
that's it. Because if you've shown that you can compromise yourself in one way, how are your audience to know, even with laws and guidelines pointing things out, how are they to be able to trust and believe that you're not compromising your coverage in other ways um, as well? And this isn't a board game problem. This is a problem in all journalism. It's mm. junkets. It's, it's you know, car journalists getting flown out for three days to drive a BMW around a racetrack. Mm -hmm. It's it's Google and Apple holding exclusive events where they only let you touch a phone for 20 minutes, but then you're supposed to write a review about it or something. Like, it's not, <laughs> this isn't exclusive to board games at all, but I think the same criteria applies, is that once you compromise your sort of principles of covering and why you're covering games that's it it's all over for you well okay so that seems foreboding i just want to drill down a little bit what, yeah. what do you mean <laughs> that's it so 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 okay so this might be a slight change of topic but one of my biggest concerns with content creation and you've touched on this already jason is not the content that's being created people are making fun videos people are making entertaining videos that's fine. If you want to be entertained by something and or watch the rules to a video or to a board game, that's fine. My larger concern with so much board game content creation is why are people getting into it? Mm -hmm. Like what's making you want to do this? And what are you hoping to produce? Like, are you in this to tell stories or to critically appraise something? Um, I'm sure Keith would agree. Most people get into journalism at some point or another because they want to tell stories. Um, yep. Do Are you doing that by just continuously hyping up board games or are you just working as a promoter, as a hype man, as, a, as an advertiser? Um, to me, that's that's a fundamental misstep at, at the first point that a lot of people get into this that then makes everything else so difficult. And so what I've said about how one step compromises you forever might sound extreme, but I think if you get into this in the in the correct frame of mind, like, like again, like Keith has said, if you want to go into this to have people trust your reviews and, and appreciate your critical stance on things and in a reporting case to believe and trust and find your stories important and interesting, you need to have come into this with the right frame of mind in the first place. And if all you want to do is, is make some YouTube advertising money with your friends and get free board games, I don't think like, yeah, I think that's an area where if you're less interested in the compromises or you want to operate in some kind of gray area in between, that's fine. You just can't expect your audience to go there with you. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So I can try to answer that. <laughs> I will mm -hmm. try to answer that, right? Why? The why. And I actually did a whole video on this, on the why. Why do the, the enthusiast do what we do? So he said it. Um, evangelist. We are evangelists. We love the hobby as a whole. So we hope we turn on the camera because, and I remember this specific experience, but I was like, because I'm a big cooperative gamer. I'm on the, the one-stop co-op shop. So like, I have plenty of pandemic and you see my chat. I have all space alert and all these cooperative games. Uh, and I was so enamored and like in love with this. I was like, okay, I have to, at the time it was a podcast, right? So like I, I, I called the people, uh, he, this, this other person, a podcast got my friend, Anthony, I jumped on the podcast. I just, it just kept on going and going. And it was like a, just a pure enthusiasm rush of like, wow, people are listening and you get that feedback of like, you know, I do, you know, I played this game because I heard about it from you and, you know, not necessarily bought the game. I don't, I, I personally don't care if somebody buys a game because of, I, does, does somebody play a game? Does somebody, uh, you know, enjoy a game? Does somebody show up to a game night mm -hmm. knowing that a game was being played because, I mean, like that's really where my joy comes in, right? So I think most of us who are, who are enthusiasts, we go into that with that larger goal of like spread joy, grow the hobby, right? And spread this yeah. to many people as possible, right? So we aren't coming at it from like, or most of us, right? I don't think we come at it as like, okay, I want to inform the consumer or, <laughs> you know, we don't like, okay, <laughs> I have a, 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 um, a passion to be a consumer report advocate or whatever it is. Uh, and maybe, you know, there's a telling story aspect to it and like a truth telling story. I think journalism very much a fidelity to like the truth and getting the truth out there. Um, I think for us, uh, I mean, we want the truth in a sense that like we don't want to make a bad match for people. I think a lot of enthusiasts, we would call ourselves more like matchmakers where we're more likely to say, oh, this isn't for me, but this might be for you. Or this will be this for this type of person. So the effect is it looks positive. But really what a lot of us are doing is like, 
Well, we're trying to find the audience for the people. We're not just going to sit here and say, okay, we're being critical. So that might have the effect of looking like we're hyping and we're being positive and uh, et cetera. So that would be my response in terms of that motivation piece and why maybe that motivation makes it look like we're more shilly and positive than we might actually be. So what, do you buy that? <laughs> what do you well, think that's what that? I'm saying. That's your, your, in also you're an out, you're an outlaw here. You're running a podcast talking about ethics in board games journalism. I think you're a very yeah. extreme <laughs> um, example fair. of this. Um, <laughs> fair, fair. Like you've just mentioned it though, your intent and what, other people may perceive from the content could be two different things is is you can't wear your intent on your sleeve every time you're making constantly positive reviews only your work can speak for that and so i'll admit like i'm an outlier even among a lot of video game people where i'm ruthlessly critical quite often because i'm of the personal opinion that critics need to be critical because that helps the audience gain a better understanding a good critic I think, Keith, you again mentioned this earlier, a good critic can criticize something and say they didn't enjoy a game mm -hmm. and you can still read that review and want to play it or think it's a good game because they're a good critic. It's and a weird so, thing of critical coverage of like, the more critical you are, the more trust you can gain. And there is a bleeding edge to that. If you're too critical, if you're critical, yeah. it's like a, you know, like a brand, then that's not a great yeah, thing. Yeah, you can come across as, as a hater, you know, right, or right, someone right, yeah. that's just yeah. out to get clicks or whatever. Right. But, but at the same if, time, um, it's like, yeah, I, 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 one of my uh, people on Discord, it's like, I like when my reviewers nitpick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you nitpick can be critical works. without, you can be critical without being obviously right. artificial about it. You know, I'm I like to be quite upfront with saying like, like I will not enjoy a game, a board game that has engine building in it, right? And I, I won't tear that game down. I will just say I don't like these games. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Like if you're if you're if that's what you want out of this review, I'm sorry. Like I don't like these games. If you do, maybe you will. I don't know. I can't help you. I think that's more useful to someone than always trying to temper your coverage to be some kind of positive in in the hopes you may convince some like generic approximation of a person out there with your thoughts on a board game. But <laughs> the complicated yeah. matter here is that a critic is a, is an individual and it is a subjective experience. And so we can't approximate mm -hmm. our coverage to say, well, critics say this and enthusiasts say this because everybody should be saying something different. And I guess that gets back to the heart of my criticism that that's not what we're getting in a lot of board game content mm -hmm. creation because a lot of people are pulling their punches, whether it's, because they don't want to accept publishers, whether it's because they don't want people to like be down on them or they're going to think they've been hating or they just want to keep a positive vibe on their channel. You know, there could be any number of reasons. Um, okay. Uh, what do you think about, um, to go, go on you, Keith, about that gray zone that I articulated? So like there is, you know, the pay to play, like bag of money paradigm, which I truly don't think, I think that I really do think it's a boogeyman. doesn't really happen. Mm -hmm. Um you know, despite like the controversy, whatever. Um, but right. I really did. I, let's just kind of like put that out there. It's not, I don't think it happens. Um, then the journalistic review, which I think you try to emulate, but then there's a gray area in, in the middle of like people who say pay for, you know, uh, had to pay previews, but then it, they do kind of unpaid reviews or they do, they do kind of seem to exist for the review copy churn or whatever it is. There's a lot of different aspects of the gray area. Do you feel like there is a uh, like what like I should, I'll ask it open-ended. Uh, what, what do you think of that idea of a gray area? And are you as kind of, no, don't do that as Luke would be, or do you have a different perspective? Yeah, I don't think you can exist in the gray area. I just think that that's, that's, you've, you've pushed yourself. You cannot operate, say a channel where you are taking publisher money to produce promotional content, whatever it might be. And at the same time, trying to provide objective game reviews or commentary because you are compromised. You are taking money from companies you are attempting to cover, and you simply can't do that. I could not take money from the Boston Red Sox um, mm. for anything. Where, but you it, take you, junkets and you get travel and you get all the other well, stuff, right? Isn't that great? Right, you, if, if you could, that's a gray area, right? I, all my travel is paid for by The Athletic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if a company, actually there's one time in my entire career, I did something where an agency, a player agency paid for something. They paid for a hotel and they took me around to see their players in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And we were very upfront 
with um because the trip was just simply not going to happen otherwise and we were very upfront i was went through processes at e i was at espn times a long time ago to see is does this violate our rules on ethics is this even remotely permissible you know eventually we decided yes and we were clear i hope with readers about what was and was not being paid for um and i will say like to me that's you know, after that experience, my thought was, I'm never doing that again. I don't mm-hmm. like where that sits with me personally, even though my company, which ESPN, whatever you think of the brand, the very, very high journalistic standards. Mm-hmm. Those are people that by and large, those are people who come from legacy newspapers, other legacy media and bring those standards forward. I will say I personally thought that feels compromised to me. And that is, and I've never done it again um, in any line of work. And I think that is a, a we have a pretty clear analog here where if you're taking money from publishers or publicists or you know now there are a couple of publishers use third party media third party uh, publicists some of whom are great but you can't take money from them and you mm. can't take you know to me like when the goodie bag that you get at a con like that better be games mm. and if there's like a little trinket or a miniature fine you can throw a keychain in there I'm not going to care right there better not be a stack of hundreds at the bottom of the thing right there's a, <laughs> there is a line that we cross we have there's some rule at the athletic there's some certain dollar amount like if somebody wants to buy my lunch while we're out like they don't care right that's not going to sway my coverage if they bought me a you know you know somehow something of, of of greater value right there's a limit there is a threshold i think we all sort of understand that you want to give me a little trinket that's f- f- whatever i you know Funko had these little Jurassic Park buttons for when they came out with that legacy game. And I gave them to my kids like, no, but that's not swaying my coverage, certainly, but that there is a line. And that once you've crossed that, especially if you're crossing it, I really should take back to your example where you're doing both on the same site. I think one, your integrity is in question. And two, you create confusion in the consumer. And I think it's at that point, it's very hard to untangle that, to to Mm -hmm. unconfuse the consumer. Okay, I'm going to push this a little further because, I mean, I think mm-hmm. the wad of cash kind of looms large, but it, it's so much deeper than that. I did, I'll cover this in another video on bias. So a lot of times publishers will have content creators as demo workers, right, at a, at a convention. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's what happens, right? So like we want to go to Gen Con, we want to go to you know, different uh, different things and everything, and we can't get there on our own for various reasons. Uh, so we're demoing for a company. I mean, I, I, I will admit I did, I demoed my, when I first, my first packs, I would never have gone, had Renegade Game, uh, game Studios, makers of all sorts of uh, awesome games, acquire and great. And everything. Uh, I demoed for them. Right. Uh, and you know, they, mm-hmm. they had, there was actually a payment there. And I remember I was writing reviews at the time and then, you know, and I was like, okay, I demoed for them. And I put that on the, on the review and everything. I will not agree. I will not give this a final score because I did, I demoed for them. I remember I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, Another example, and again, I'll use myself as an example. Um, when I first launched my YouTube channel, this was three years ago at this point, uh, I got a scholarship, uh, a Bi- the BIPOC scholarship fund. It was like it was at the time of Black Lives Matter uh, from Jamie Stegmeyer, our mutual friend from Stonemaier mm-hmm. Games, uh, gave yep, me a hundred, a hundred bucks for lights and camera stand and all that kind of stuff. And I disclosed that at the beginning of like the intro video, like, okay, thank you for your, uh, uh, whatever it is. And he, and Jamie is really good. He sponsors actually does a lot of sponsoring and he posts that on his channel. That's not, none of this is secret. Um, so there's so, and I'm not even, I'm, um, there are people who get hired by companies, you know, and, and, and there's a, the pipeline is very open. Like when you really look at it, there's a whole mess of stuff, right. Uh, in terms of, you know that that gray area, and and so many of us exist in the gray. I I, I exist in the gray. I, I'm very open about that. Um, so if I were to say do a top ten in 2023 of worker placement games, and I put Viticulture on my top ten worker placement games, do I need to three years out disclose that I <laughs> I I got this scholarship from Jamie Stegmeyer? Do I need to not put it on at all because mm-hmm. I got this scholarship? I I. I I know I, I seem like I'm nitpicking, but this is this is what lawyers do, right? Like you drill down. What mm-hmm. I really want to know <laughs> from a journalist perspective, where is the gray area and where am I safe? Again, from a journalist, quote unquote, media perspective. So Luke, go ahead and uh, give us give your response to that. You would have had, if you took any money from Stonemaier Games, you would have had to recuse yourself from any Stonemaier coverage. And is that like forever? Yeah. Like forever, it's like I, that is yeah. not a thing that I can yeah. ever do. If if, if yeah. I was a journalist, which I'm not that's, a journalist, so. like that's that's the decision you make, though. You know, 
Like no one made you take the money. And I'm not saying this to criticize you. I'm just sure. saying from a journalistic point of view and the kind yeah. of content that I, the kind of journalism I would have produced at Kotaku, like we would, we would never, you could never have taken any money or any, anything from anyone um, signed any kind of deals, done any kind of side work um, without, well, I mean, that never happened in the first place, but if it had, you would have had to recuse yourself from more coverage of them. And if I was or, working for Kotaku, that would not have happened. Right. And if I was working for a journalistic outfit, but I'm, but I'm not working for, I'm, I'm working for Jason Perez, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah. I'm, I'm an independent yeah. enthusiast there's in, and I'm trying to do my best that I can with disclosures and all kind of stuff. And yep. influencers, there's a whole different model for influencers than for uh journalists. So I probably be falling mm -hmm. to more of the influencer bucket. So it's, it's whatever, but this, this is, we, that's a fuzzy border and I want to get your opinion on what the border is. And it sounds like for you, the border is pretty, Sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, we, I think we've established that over the last sure, 10 sure. or 15 minutes. I think one of the reasons this conversation is so heated in some ways is that board games content creation and, and media has spun off so far mm -hmm. from a lot of other standards that the degree to which people point things that are not savory, you know, point out things that aren't particularly savory by traditional journalistic standards are so embedded in board game coverage that it has it makes people defensive or questioning or it's like, well, I can't, I can't, I can't recuse myself. This kind of coverage is, is systemic in everything I do. And that's like, okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. But then you have a systemic problem in your coverage mm -hmm. if you want to adhere to some kind of standards and no one's making, like, I just want to get this clear to anybody who's listening to this, like no one's making you do anything. I'm, I'm not, I'm not the journalism police. Yeah. Luke is not telling you know, me to shut down my channel. I'm not, I'm I'm not telling you to shut your channel down. <laughs> your, your channel might be great for all I know. But like my only problem is that, and I guess that's why we're all here talking about this, is that sure. you can't hold yourself to any kind of critical or journalistic standard if you're not going to put in the work. And um, would you say like calling calling oneself media, does that inherently hold one to that standard? When we get the media badge, we walk around yeah. with media. Well, this is the problem right. we talked about earlier. Like this is semantics, but it's evolved to a point with board games where it's difficult to rein that back. Like mm -hmm. that word has such a different meaning in board games than it would to somebody in another field that I don't know how you could stop people wanting to call themselves media. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not the I'm not the English language police either, so I can't help there either. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and if someone wants to come up with a better word, for it because i don't think i think content creation is i don't think that's right either right um because it's right. you know it implies images of tiktok influences and you know mm. instagram like ai can content create and that's not yeah what we're doing. yeah yeah, yeah. It's, right it's, it's it's not it's it's i don't know if i could come up with the word i'd probably keep it to myself and sell t-shirts with it or something <laughs> or, or, or grab right, right, the right. url while i still could but <laughs> yeah um, so I, have a, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say in this respect, Keith, because you had just you, you did one trip and whatever. But I want to I want to hear you say uh, I'll talk a little bit more about like the de the case of like the demo and the the scholarship that happened four years ago. And like the, there's so many little ways in which the, the streams can be crossed. Is it as disqualifying for you as as Luke describes in terms of like the uh, capital would... and media? Because I think I can concoct a scenario or conceive a, con a scenario where you know, a person who, especially where, you know, we are trying, I think all of us want to create or see more diversity in our space mm. um, on all levels of our space. And so, sure, I can see a scenario where you describe a, um, you describe a, you know, you got a scholarship of some sort to attend a convention and, cover it in some way. Sure. I can certainly see a scenario where that is a thing where that, where I would say it's acceptable for you to cover games by that particular publisher or whoever funded that with an, with appropriate disclaimers mm -hmm. um, for, for some long period of time, certainly like it's, you know, 10 years ago, but this person funded something that gave you a start in your industry, in the industry. Yeah. Okay. You, you got to disclose that. You mm -hmm. really do. Um, always err on the side of disclosing versus not disclosing. Sure. But you know, in situations like that, where it is not that they paid you something to produce favorable content, to me, that's it. You're just you're you're yeah. You, the bag of the money. Plague. Here's a game. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You got the <laughs> plague. That's it. Right. Where right. 
I'm willing to at least entertain an argument. I'm not saying I disagree with Luke, but and also I think Luke's position is is pretty defensible. But I'm willing to to concede that there's a little bit of wiggle room, and I I do think that it matters if if we're talking about people who come from diverse backgrounds, because our space is so very not diverse mm. at this moment. Okay, so that it leads into the last topic, and I want to Luke had actually mentioned this in the article too, so I'll, I'll bring this up in terms of mm-hmm. okay, so there is an argument where okay, it, it is not cheap to produce content. It is not cheap to have the lights, to have the I have a nice little Yeti mic, and it's not even that nice. Like I can get a much better mic. Uh, and there's all these all these things that have to happen in terms of making content, making just what we do, right? There's something cheap. So, and mm-hmm. also the publishers do receive value from what we do. Like, I mean, Keith, you're, you, people get more coverage if you, you write about a game or, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I think um, uh, a friend of mine, Kevin Bertram, friend of mine, Kevin Bertram, who's a publisher, yeah. uh, sent the game yeah. to Polygon, journalistic outfit, and uh, votes for women. And the votes for women ended up getting a bunch of positive coverage and everything. Uh, yeah. And you could see Great the sales, game. right? Uh, you could see the sales. So the idea that, and I wanted, you said something before that like, if they hadn't paid for this this trip, it wouldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. The argument is that if that publishers aren't as if the publishers aren't as open with the review copies, the relationships, the occasional payment for paid review, pay previews, etc., that most board game coverage just wouldn't happen, and that we would be poor for it, and that the, the board game hobby would be at this much smaller stage. And you know, I mean, at the end of the day, like, what are we doing? We're doing. We want. We want this. We love this hobby. We want it to thrive and everything. If Mm -hmm. we had just people who adhere to journalistic standards, then the, 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 the finances don't work. And so it is only the publishers that are willing (laughs) to fund, send scholarships, uh, you know, uh, do the pay preview thing, et cetera. It is a fact in the world that diverse, you know, people's marginalized people do not have the standing capital to be able to be in this hobby. This is an expensive hobby. This I'm look, you're looking at some cost over here in terms of the, the the wall of board games and everything. Half of these are review copies. This would not happen in terms of my own socioeconomic status if it wasn't for review copies. I'm very open about that. And most of us, you know, who are women, LGBTQ, marginalized people, uh, we couldn't do this at all without some kind of material support to kind of get us in the door and you know the, the convention and everything. So if there was this hard wall in media, board game media, then it would look like the people who could self-fund. And my my friend Keith Law, who doesn't miss Gen Con, who, uh, who pays for, who has a, a board game budget and everything like that, it, it would be a, a lot of people that look like my friend Keith Law over here. Uh, and mm-hmm. that we would be much poorer. And like the diversity goal creates a little bit of a wrinkle to the standard, like, okay, don't take any payment. So what do you think about that? It does. But it doesn't change the outcome at the end of the day either. So that's just something that I think everybody has to weigh up on their own standards and desired outcomes for it. I agree that it is because we see the exact same thing in video games. Video mm-hmm. games was for a very long time. You were a white American male aged 24 to 35. You played the same games growing up. You you like the same things in your spare time. And it was a very generic bland sort of field of cultural writing around mm-hmm. it and then the diversity that sort of blossomed in video game press in the last 10 or 15 years has really blown that up um what the difference i would say there in some ways is that in video games a lot of that came from writing which has a much lower mm-hmm. cost barrier in it um and there's nothing stopping people from writing about board games either i think if you make the decision that you're going into a field that involves spending thousands of dollars on camera and lighting equipment and you need help from publishers and that does increase the diversity of the scene in terms of that kind of coverage that is good it will still have the same bad outcomes (laughs) at the end of it and that's everybody just has to weigh that up on their own terms i think I, i think coming down one side or the other on that argument you're gonna have regrets and problems either way so this is my one gray zone allowance for this for this entire well, I mean, discussion i think is I it something you just yeah i love that answer because it's not scoldy it's not don't do it like and, and i think that's a big problem with my my uh taking these conversations is that like a lot of folks 
who come at it from the quote unquote journalistic perspective are very scoldy of like, don't do it. This is bad. Don't do paid reviews. And I can see the finger through the screen. Right? <laughs> it, just, it feels like, and there's like this, this incredulous thing of like, how could you think paid reviews? Are okay. And I love what you said because it's sensitive to the situation, but it also puts forward like, okay, do the situation, but, and here are mm-hmm. the things that we're seeing. Right. So like consumer trust is difficult. If that's mm-hmm. if that's a way that that people from more diverse backgrounds have to be brought in to the scene, then take advantage of that and then welcome. Now you can join in the same discussion we've been having for the last hour and a half. That is mm. a massive bummer in all <laughs> other kinds of, in all other kinds of ways. <laughs> But I sincerely hope that people have like some true through lines and like okay, to, can evaluate their own practice and uh, you know in terms of like okay, what should I take and you know should I do paid previews and not reviews and da 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 da. And I'm, that's what I'm hopeful for at the end of the day. Um, uh, Keith, so um, in terms of that, you had mentioned before about the diversity goal. Um, Mm -hmm. And you said you were going to make some kind of allowance for it. Um, I mean, how, I know this is a tough question, but like, how far does that go for you? Right. Because it's a greater good argument. And you are trying to balance two things that are inherently subjective and probably unquantifiable, right? The benefit of bringing more people from diverse backgrounds into our hobby, into our space, whether it is on the media slash content creator side or on the publisher side or just people playing the games right we've all you know all of us have been to a convention somewhere in the world and looked around and noticed it could be more diverse yeah to put it mildly so you know i i view that as a pretty important goal for everyone in the space um I do think our community is very generally very inclusive so it is often a matter of simply getting people into sort of figuratively and literally in the doors. Sure. Um, you could open the doors, right? but it takes a little bit to people get in the doors because we don't know what's behind the door. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I right. trust me, I am. And to say as somebody who's sort of got a lot of social anxiety too, we have always been very, very happy with how inclusive the hobby has been, but also like I'm a straight cis white guy. So, you know, that's the, well, most spaces are pretty inclusive of me. Um, so it's, I'm maybe not exactly the best example, but anyway, the, to, to answer your specific question though, then how do I, you know, how far does that go? Um, right now, I think the need to get more diversity into our general space is pretty acute. And so I'd be, I would probably give more slack, more wiggle room now, whereas I'm hoping two or three years from now or five years from now, that's much less, right? This should be closing as the space becomes mm. more diverse. And if it doesn't become more diverse, then that's, that's this whole separate problem. So but we've done like am, that, that, that's been like, we've destroyed computer trust and not made the hobby mess <laughs> more diverse. Yeah. That'd be an yeah, apocalypse. You're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. I mean, I do love when I see anything. I, I remember a couple, two, two years ago, Gen Con, uh, having dinner with a, a group whose uh, designer I am friends with had put it together. And there was a, a good mix of us in the room, media content creators, et cetera. And w- looking around and thinking, hey, this isn't too bad. There were like 10 to 12 of us in the room. And I think it was almost 50 50 um, people who identified as men versus women. And there was clearly some racial diversity in the room. It's like, this is good. This is the kind of space I want this to be. I want rooms to look like this. Obviously, it's small sample and it's sure. it's it's just one instance, but still it's like, okay, if there are young people of color, young women becoming content creators in this space, and some of whom might move over to maybe more of the media side, great. We're heading in the right direction. Mm-hmm. But I, to answer your gen to, to the broader question here though, there has to be disclosure. If there's any kind of relationship, let's say a non-fiduciary relationship between content creator, media, and a publisher, it must be disclosed. Mm-hmm. Anything beyond a review copy, or like I said, whatever, it's some tiny trinket. I, you know, I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. Somebody buys you a super expensive dinner. That counts. You got to disclose it. Mm-hmm. You have to say, here's what happened, or here's what this relationship entailed. Um, if you want to have the trust to the consumer, and if you want to maintain your professionalism. I mean, to me, that is just a, it's a very basic thing. And once you've lost it, I think Luke and I have both articulated this at different times in this conversation. Once you've lost it, you really can't get it back. Mm. Okay. 
Uh, so uh, as Luke said, very generous for the time. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for exploring uh, stuff. Um, is there anything, any part of this conversation that you came into it that we may have missed? Or is there anything that you want to emphasize? Uh, speak now or, <laughs> or hold your peace until the next time. Um, I will just add, I I don't mean any of this as personal criticism of anybody making anything out there in board games. Um, I tend, any, anything I've ever said or written about this is more of a systemic um, issue and comes from a place where I realize that most fields of journalism have evolved, not only structurally, but legally and in terms of how audiences relate with them sort of one way. And then board games, given their recency and and the fact they've come of age in, in a very different time period, have sort of evolved a different way mm -hmm. and it's so far away from the others that someone with a journalism background can't help but sometimes be a little alarmed at the discrepancies and and gaps that we've all been speaking about for the last hour and a half i'm it's because i know you mentioned earlier jason you can sometimes feel scolded or something mm -hmm. like that i don't I'm, i apologize if i've ever felt like i've scolded someone i've never meant to i'm just well, that's a function of Twitter. Twitter is like the school. Yeah, it's oh, bad, man. I'm it's sorry, bad for X, that. Twitter, X. Yeah. Twitter X. <laughs> but I, it, most journalists who are speaking about this will come from a place where we can just see something's evolved so far off the baseline that we sometimes have to be very clear with like, hey, this is way off base than what we're used to. And that if you want to have any kind of serious, critical or journalistic discussions about this, you might need to rein it in a little. Hmm. Um and maybe question why you've got into this and what you're what you want to get out of it. If all you want to do is is film yourself playing games with your friends, make some money, have some fun, please keep doing it. You know, evangelize the medium. No one's gonna no one's gonna stop you. That's that's amazing. Um, if you did get into it to try and tell stories and be a more serious critic about it, um, and you are finding yourself compromised in any ways, though, this is where I would hope, you know, you can sort of take some of this advice and maybe take a second look at what the relationships you have and the kind of content you're producing and see how some of those can be addressed. Wonderful. Keith, anything that you came in wanting to talk about that we missed or did we cover a lot of the bases? No, we actually, when we ended up, we ended up, I didn't know that we would get into that conversation about diverse backgrounds, but mm -hmm. I'm thrilled, certainly thrilled that we did. Um, I do think I'm Puerto Rico, man. To... You knew that. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Oh, I know that very well. You and I have talked about that. I didn't know that we'd get to it on this particular podcast but i'm thrilled that we did um and i do think it's something that that well all of us in the industry should be talking about um whether you're sort of tangentially in the industry like i am or, or people who do it full time should be talking about it a lot more and and I, I i will say that you know we've been fairly critical in a lot of ways over the course of this conversation and but there is a lot of hope and i am optimistic this space is growing and the fact that wire cutter part of the New York times wanted it wanted, they have somebody who writes regularly about board games and reached out to me and asked if I would write something too. And you know what? That's a great sign. I am. I think we're, we're going to head in the right direction. I'm not an optimist by nature, but in this case, I, I do think we'll get there. So you think that like board gaming will develop some more of a journalistic standard and that there'll be clearer lines between the enthusiast and the the journalist. Yeah. What I think you'll see is that striation, right? There'll be some separation. There will be the folks who who do this on a more professional level, who do this more seriously. Um, and then there will be, and there's space for the enthusiasts. There will always be a place yeah. for folks who are just fans of the hobby. And, and you know, it's, it's like fans of sports teams, right? Mm -hmm. And fan blogs. I have no issue with fan blogs. Just don't compare what they're doing to what I'm doing because we're doing two different things. Mm. We're serving two different audiences and we have two, we have very different standards with very different goals. There is plenty of room in the world for both. Mm. That media word, man, <laughs> calling both media can be mm -hmm. difficult. So uh, an opportunity to um, uh, reflect on that. Uh, Luke, uh, this is my very last question. Your level of hope. Uh, do you think that board gaming will follow the trend of video gaming on a long trail or or, or is it a different trail because of the, the technical source circumstances that we talked about? Uh, no, I, I'm optimistic as well. I think video games evolved a certain type of criticism and journalism through a sense of inevitability. Um, the industry got bigger and bigger and bigger and it, it drew more and more people into it who reached a certain age and got a certain type of qualification to get into the field to improve the level of its journalism and criticism um no one sat down one day and said we've just got to make video game journalism better you know it just 
slowly happened. It happened over the course of my time at Kotaku. Like when I started in 2006, there was six or eight of us just writing absolute crap. <laughs> you know, and, and what we were writing in 2006 was light years above what was being written on other websites. Mm. And then what we write now, it's a good thing our servers don't have 2006 stories on them anymore because I'd be too embarrassed to read them. Mm. You know, the, these fields continue evolving as people put it, put work into them and, and sort of can look back on their coverage and improve things. Board games, as long as we can overcome the larger structural challenges to journalism, um, I think board games will inevitably do the same. Mm -hmm. If you look at today, like, could you have had this discussion we ha we've had today five years ago, 10 mm -hmm. years ago, you know, where you've not only got two people from outside fields in here to talk to you about this, but we've name dropped, you know, there is serious board game coverage on Polygon as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are sites like Dicebreaker, you know, there are mm -hmm. established people doing proper video game journalism and criticism and you know i just think inevitably as as people's enthusiasm and love for board games gets bigger provided we can find a way that people can get paid to keep doing it um we will get more more and better criticism and journalism um mm -hmm. that can sit alongside the current content creation like keith said video games is no different for every Kotaku, there are a hundred thousand people streaming games on Twitch. You know, I'm never going to say a bad word about that because that's what they love and that's what they do. And those things are separate. A lot of what we've talked about today can boil down to the fact that a lot of board game coverage is really only those people on Twitch or YouTube. You know, there's very little mm -hmm. written serious journalism and criticism being done. Um, well, there's a lot of it, so but it doesn't have the audience. Yeah, it's very it's very niche. It's right. it's not in a position where people there's a staff of full time people like there are at some video game outlets. So yeah, as as it evolves, I'm sure you know that will happen in some space, and then that can act as an influence for other people. And you know, uh, what's the saying? A rising tide lifts all boats. Yep. Lifts all boats. Um, yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so Keith, uh, you are going to Gen Con, and you have your blog, which is the Dish. Uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, give us your socials and tell us, uh, you know, is that uh, is that we is that what we have to expect from you in the board gaming space? Yes. Um, so ugh, my socials, what a list it is now, right? <laughs> I'm on X. You mean Twitter? Uh, you can usually find me. It's Keith Law in most places. Spoutable, Blue Sky, Threads, and Instagram. It's Mr. Keith Law, Mr. Keith Law. Facebook. It's Keith Law Writer. You can find me in the Dish slash blog if you like baseball and you want my content, it's theathletic.com. Um, you can find most of my board game writing at Paste. I also write for Vulture, um, once for Wirecutter, occasionally for Polygon. Uh, you know, if you want to give me some money to write about board games, I'm pretty much available, as it turns out. And as for Gen as long Con, as you're not a publisher, do, do not write for public. Do not publisher. Do not nope, offer money to write. <laughs> nope, nope. Ix, Ixnay on the publisher pay. Yeah, right. Um, and I will say, so for folks who, you know, I've, there'll be some reviews coming and out of Gen Con, what I always do is the 10 most interesting or best looking games, not aesthetics, my, the ones I'm most excited about that I see. And then a review of absolutely everything I saw and played in the four days I was there, which is usually the longest board game thing I write all year. And I can't believe people like it, but they do. People come up to me at conventions. They're like, oh, that thing you do after Gen Con is amazing. I'm like, Really? Yeah. Like, I didn't think anybody actually read that thing. But I feel very obligated to, I saw all these good games. I have to tell people about them yeah, sure. because I just I just love what we do. Excellent. Uh, so, Luke, it, it actually did make my eyes go like this to see that you were parting from Kotaku because that's all I know you for. You've been there since so long. Institution. That's, that's and... all I know. It's all I know myself for. I'm struggling <laughs> with it at the moment. So. <laughs> uh, and so if you can tell us a little bit about what you are thinking for the future in terms of board game writing content uh, and if people can, you know, where do people can link up with you in your socials? Yeah, look, it's no longer at Kotaku.com. You can find me at LukePlunkett.com. That's my mm. temporary landing page where I've just got my socials and I've doing a bit of freelance sort of journalism work, a bit of freelance consultancy work. So for, for video games, they're born games and media. So people want to get in touch with me. That's probably the easiest way to do so. Keith mm -hmm. Law, Luke Plunkett, thank you so much for an excellent conversation. My pleasure. No worries. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thank you. If you can change your mind, you can change the world, people. So until next time, later, everybody. <laughs>